Welcome everyone and thank you for participating in today's event, the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians Breast and Cervical Cancer Guidelines for Screening and Survivorship, what they mean for your patient. I'm Erin Yeck, the Director of Education for the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians. The American Cancer Society estimates that more than 43,000 women will die from breast cancer and more than 4,000 women will die from cervical cancer in the United States in 2022. If found early, Nearly all breast and cervical cancers can be treated successfully, and that's what we're here to learn about today. OFP, in partnership with the Ohio Department of Health, is providing today's webinar for Ohio's family physicians and their practice teams to learn more about breast and cervical cancer guidelines, screening, survivorship, and programs that can offer assistance, like the Ohio Department of Health Breast and Cervical Cancer Project, or BCCP. BCCP can financially assist those eligible in Ohio in obtaining breast and cervical cancer screening and diagnostic, diagnostic procedures. In addition, the BCCP Patient Navigation Program provides guidance in navigating the healthcare system, finding providers and community resources, answering questions about scheduling appointments, using insurance, and more, regardless of eligibility. Joining us today to provide an overview of breast and cervical cancer guidelines is Dr. Kelly Rath, a gynecological oncologist with Ohio Health. Dr. Rath earned her medical degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, completed residency at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center in Obstetrics and Gynecology, and is fellowship trained in gynecological oncology from Ohio State University Hospitals. For today's session, Dr. Rath will provide insight to determine appropriate breast and cervical cancer screening guidelines to apply to a patient, counsel a patient about breast and cervical cancer screening options and intervals, establish the survivorship plan for a patient who has breast or cervical cancer, and manage ongoing screening for breast and cervical cancer survivors. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Rath, I will go ahead and hand it over to you. You can take it away. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for having me today. Um, so I'm Kelly Rath. I'm a GUN oncologist here at Ohio Health. Um, I also work with the Ohio Partners for Cancer Control on the executive team, as well as um, I'm a work group lead for cervical cancer prevention in Ohio. So um, cancer prevention is near and dear to my heart, and I'm excited to talk with you about this today. So we've already talked about the objectives, kind of reviewing our screening guidelines, figuring out um, the appropriate screening for patients, um, as well as to talk a little bit about survivorship care plans and how to take care of our patients after a cancer diagnosis. So we'll start kind of reviewing cervical cancer and HPV infection. I like to um, start with this kind of every cervical cancer talk that I give. Um, so we already talked about about 4,000 deaths a year from cervical cancer and about 14,000 new cases. Um, you can see in my infographic here, Ohio is dark blue and this dark blue is not great. We have one of the highest HPV associated cancer rates in the country. So certainly um, screening our patients for cervical cancer is incredibly important. Um, we know that um, black women are most likely to die from cervical cancer and women, uh, Hispanic women are most likely to be diagnosed with cervical cancer. Um, we, there we go. Um, a little technical difficulty on the uh, advancing there. So there are about 15 million cervical cancer screenings a year with three and a half million abnormal results leading to about 30, 300,000 cervical cancer pre-cancer cases. And like we said before, 14,000 cervical cancer cases and about 4,000 deaths. So we said almost all cervical cancer is related to HPV infection. More than 99% of cervical cancers can be traced back to this. So most risk factors for cervical cancer are related to HPV infection. So increased exposure to HPV, more partners, higher risk partners, a longer period of sexual activity, um, early first birth, multiple births, or having a, a non circumcised circumcised partner um, can increase the HPV exposures. Also patients that have a history of vulvar, vaginal, anal, HPV related disease, or those patients that are immunosuppressed are less likely to be able to clear the HPV virus on their own. Non-HPV related factors include socioeconomic status, limited access to um, care and to screening, smoking um, as it relates to squamous cell cancers, as well as we're starting to do research on genetics. Are there genetic reasons that some people may not clear an HPV 
infection, but other people may. Um, as well as use of OCPs or birth control pills can um, slightly increase the risk of cervical cancer. Um, we know that there are lots of different types of HPV and the ones that we care about as it relates to cervical cancer are those high risk or oncogenic subtypes. We know that multiple cancers are related to HPV exposure, including cervical, anogenital cancers, oral pharyngeal cancers. Um, we know that low grade disease can cause warts and laryngeal papillomatosis, as well as uh, multiple other HPVs cause problems um, that are not um, cancer related. Um, we know that HPV infection is asymptomatic and can occur with any intimate sexual contact as well as self-inoculation. Almost all of us, more than 80% of us will be exposed to HPV at some point in our lifetime. It's important to remember that we really don't screen men for HPV infection. There's no commercially available test. We know that men do have HPV when we do tests and studies. Um, male partners of women with HPV um, have an HPV infection about 60% of the time and between 10 and 30% of them will have of um, a precancer of the penis if we evaluate it. We know that routine condom use can um, prevent HPV um, transmission and that regression of lesions is more common when condoms are used than not. And we know that HPV is cleared also with condom use. Um, the natural history of HPV infection is that most of us clear it. Uh, very few of us will develop a persistent infection that re results in low or high grade dysplasia or even invasive cancer. We know that invasive cancer takes between the nine and 15 years to develop on average. Certainly some of these can be more aggressive and people could develop cancer more quickly than that. But in general, we have a lot of time to catch this cancer early, which is really great. Um, one thing I always like to mention during any cervical cancer talk that I give is just a note on latent controlled infection. So once a patient has HPV and that HPV test is negative, it doesn't mean that their body has necessarily completely cleared the infection. It could be latent and it could reactivate due to loss of immune control at some point in their lifetime. I can't give a talk also without mentioning vaccine. Um, so we have a great vaccine that prevents um, HPV and will decrease the risk of our HPV related cancers. We want to give it to kids between 11 and 12. They only need two doses before 15, three doses above 15, or if they're immunocompromised. Um, this, public, this was published in October of 2020. It was the first paper really showing a decrease in cervical cancer with HPV vaccination. And the most important thing on this trial um, is highlighted in the red. Patients that got the vaccine before age 17 had a much lower rate of cervical cancer cancer than those that got the vaccine above 17 and obviously those that are unvaccinated. So just kind of a reminder, we all know it's important to vaccinate for HPV when people are younger. And this is just kind of like showing us, yes, it's true. We do prevent cervical cancer with the vaccine when we do it younger. Um, so let's talk about screening and the guidelines. I think that the cervical cancer guidelines have probably changed um, like six times since I went to med school and residency. Um, when I was in residency, people were getting pap smears every three months. And so I think it's really difficult to keep up with this. Um, the only way that I can remember it is to have the ASCCP app on my phone. And so it's a little expensive for an app. It's $10, but you can get it for free web-based. And so this is what I refer to routinely in my practice to kind of figure this out. Um, so in 2019, what is new? What has changed in our guidelines? And so we're really transitioning from uh, recommendations based on risk, a patient's risk when we combine multiple factors as opposed to just a result one moment in time. And by doing this, we're able to defer patients, um, defer colposcopy for some patients, uh, expedite treatment for other patients, um, one thing that they called out is they want to specify CIN2 versus CIN3, and you'll see a little later in my talk why that is. Um, we know that we can observe CIN1 as opposed to proceeding with excision. Um, we want to make sure we're excising the high-grade lesions. We want to use reflex cytology um, as opposed to reflex HPV testing, which is a little bit of a change. Um, we never go back to every five-year screening for patients that have, have had an abnormal result. And they really call out the need to use HPV-based testing. So cytology is really only seen as an acceptable cervical cancer screening method if HPV-based testing is not available for some reason. Um, and so just kind of to summarize, the patient's risk of developing cervical cancer or precancer is really estimated using our current screening results, previous screening results and biopsy results, as well as personal factors of age and immunosuppression.
Um, remembering that routine screening is only applying to asymptomatic individuals that do not have prior abnormal screenings and that persistent HPV is really the thing that's gonna lead to cervical cancer development. And I think remembering all of those things as we screen people will let us make sure that we're screening people the right way and catching cancer just early. Um, and so just kind of a list of the HPV tests that are um, approved and just another reminder, I have the thing about Ohio Health on there because these are some Ohio Health slides. It didn't take it off, but that was the Ohio Health test. And so you can look um, at the bottom of any of your reports if you've got HPV-based testing and you can kind of see at the bottom which one it is and kind of find out if it's approved based on this up-to-date module. Um, and again, we only want to use cytology if we don't have an FDA-approved HPV test. So who is average risk for cervical cancer screening? Patients that are asymptomatic, meaning they're not having irregular bleeding or they don't have an abnormality on their pelvic examination, patients that are immunocompetent, patients that are having their first screening, or patients that have not had a history of abnormal screening results in the past, with a few exceptions listed below that I don't accept, expect you to remember, but that will be highlighted in the app when you use it. Um, so average risk screening, again, HPV-based is preferred. Um, the USPS task force and ACS, I think, are the two guidelines to kind of focus in on. The um, preventative task force recommends starting at age 21 with every three years cytology, transitioning to HPV-based testing at age 30. The American Cancer Society recommends starting at age 25 with HPV-based testing. My personal opinion is to start at age 21 with cytology alone, transitioning to co-testing at age 25. Um, High-risk patients. So who are our patients? that need a little different cervical cancer screening. These are gonna be our patients that are immunosuppressed. And so this is what is defined as immunosuppressed per the ASCCP guidelines, HIV positive patients, patients that have had a solid organ transport, um, stem cell, lupus, or inflammatory bowel disease or rheumatologic disease with current immunosuppression. So if they have that and they're not on immunosuppression, then they aren't a high risk patient. But if they are on the immunosuppression, that's what makes them high risk. Um, so high risk patient screening. So the initial screening may happen earlier. So at age 21 or one year after the onset of sexual activity. Um, and if they're less than 25 using cytology, if they're over 25 using co-testing. And they also are gonna have a screening colposcopy at that first visit. So if you have somebody that's high risk and colposcopy, is it something that's part of your practice, referring them to a gynecologist for that first or somebody who does the colposcopy for that first screening is important. Um, subsequent screenings, screenings, if they're under 25, they're gonna do every year pap smears with say just cytology alone for three years and then switch to every three years and then change to co-testing at 25. If they're 25, they just start with the co-testing. They don't need to do the, the cytology based every three year. Post hysterectomy screening. So if somebody comes and they've had a hysterectomy, do we need to still screen for cervical cancer? Well, if their uterus and their cervix are both removed, they've had a total hysterectomy, then they probably don't need to have additional screening unless they have other high risk factors like history of cervical cancer, cervical or other HPV related disease. If they still have a cervix, they've had a subtotal or supra cervical hysterectomy, they need to continue routine cervical cancer screening. Patients probably don't know. Um, a lot of patients like will even ask me after three years if I took their cervix out when I did their hysterectomy. And so sometimes they need a pelvic exam to see if they still have a cervix. Um, it's not intuitive. Um, so when should we stop cervical cancer screening? So I want to call your attention to the bottom um, graph on my slide. About 21% of patients will be diagnosed with cervical cancer after the age of 65. And so we used to think maybe 65 was stop pap smears. And so I think that some patients maybe don't need cervical cancer screening at that age, but it's a very select group of patients. So patients that don't have a history of cervical dysplasia, patients that have had adequate prior screening and patients that don't have new partners, because if they have new partners, then they could be exposed to HPV. And even if they've had normal screening in the past, they, they have a new risk factor. And so I always say continue if they don't have adequate screening, screening if they have new partners or they have a history of high grade dysplasia. And I always, I in general recommend screening um, until they're, as long as they have a life expectancy of about 10 years. So I would just have one quick slide. I know it wasn't part of my um, objectives, but anal dysplasia screening who, so you know, the vulva, you can kind of see, but anal dysplasia is also kind of a, 
risk in this group. And so patients that are high risk, um, immunosuppressed patients with HIV, patients who have penile anal intercourse, um, people who have a history of high grade dysplasia of another area, maybe should have an anal screening. And it's an anal cytology, just like a pap smear followed by high resolution anoscopy. Colorectal surgery is typically the group that will do that the high resolution anoscopy and pretty much any colorectal group probably in the state you could refer your patients to. I know our Ohio Health Group does it here for me. Um, so using ASCCP guidelines to manage results, just a couple slides on this. So um, the big change was kind of using this 4% threshold to, to triage patients either to colposcopy, to a diagnostic test, or to um, keep them just in a screening queue of every one to three years. And so kind of looking at less than 4%, keep watching them, low grade results, send them to colposcopy, super high grade results, maybe just treat them without doing a colposcopy. And so um, here we have five year return back if they have a negative HPV test and a normal pap smear. If they're just getting cytology, they'll come back in three years, even with a normal test, or if they've had an HIV or HPV negative test with an atypical ASCUS result, they'll come back in three years. Patients that are called back in a year are going to be those um, that may have gone to colposcopy before. And so we're trying to save on some colposcopies here, save on some um, testing that creates anxiety in our patients. Um, and so some of our patients with HPV um, and low grade results with negative HPV in the last five years are patients that have HPV normal PAPs or low grade PAPs without HPV. So patients that have a greater than 4% risk are gonna be triaged to colposcopy. And these are some examples here. Um, when we, that risk based on the results of their PAP test increases above 25%, we might start to consider expedited treatment. Expedited treatment is moving forward with a cone bias biopsy or a leap procedure, so an excision of the cervix before taking a biopsy. Patients that would never be a recommended for expedited treatment would be pregnant patients, those less than 25 years old, or those that are planning future fertility. And in this range, this 25 to 59% range, it's kind of a patient and physician discussion. Do they want to move forward ex with excision or would they prefer to have the diagnostic test first? Um, for those that have a greater than 60% risk of high grade dysplasia, they really should be triaged directly to um, expedited treatment unless they have plans for future childbearing, they're pregnant, or they're less than 25. And so um, one slide on uncommon results, um, patients that high enough have these atypical glandular or epithelial cells may need additional um, evaluation of the endometrial cavity. And you can see it listed here on the slide. It's not something that probably is in your brain all the time, but just to know the ASCCP app is going to answer these questions also for you. Um, and then unsatisfactory cytology or absent transformations and what to do with those results is also listed. Um, so why do we treat these less than 25 year old patients a little differently? Um, we know that these patients may have slightly different rates of HPV because they've had the vaccine. Um, cervical cancer is rare in patients less than 25. Certainly I've seen it, but it's not common. We also know that HPV is very prevalent and likely to regress as well as high grade lesions may regress. We know that up to 60% of um, young women with CIN2 may have regression if we just watch them closely. And so excision is only um, for those that are not pregnant um, or those who have higher grade results that we can't fully evaluate or high grade lesions on their um, biopsy. Um, we try to preserve their cervix because we know that multiple cervical procedures can lead to um, difficulty um, with pregnancies in the future. Um, after abnormalities, what do we do? Kind of go back to surveillance and screening. Um, and so this is more surveillance than screening because we know we're um, not just screening, we're, we have a little higher risk. So these patients never really go back to their every um, five years. They're gonna be at every three years. We wanna make sure we're using HPV-based testing and remembering if they were using cytology that we're gonna have a shorter interval screening. Um, these patients, we should consider an HPV vaccine. There's emerging data that HPV vaccination can decrease the risk of recurrent dysplasia. Um, if vaginal screening is performed, how should you evaluate it in general um, the same way? Um, with a colposcopy and biopsy, if they have low grade changes, those can be observed and high grade changes can be treated. Um, some gynecologists and all GYN oncologists are able to manage this. And so that's a place to refer your patients.
um, abnormal pap, everything is normal. What should I do? Um, we've all been there. Um, the first thing I always do is check the ASCCP app to see if there's something that I'm missing. Um, figure out, does the patient have a cervix? Is this vaginal or cervical? Cause that's going to be different. <clears throat> Determine if my colposcopy was adequate. Make sure that I've done a perianal and a rectal examination. I've definitely had patients referred to me with um, abnormal pap smears who have ended up having an anal cancer and that was where it was coming from. So making sure that part of the exam is done. Um, checking the vulva for anything, um, and then also knowing it could be a false positive, and so reviewing your pathology. So that wraps up screening on cervical cancer. I'm going to move into breast cancer screening, and then we'll wrap up with survivorship at the end. Um, so we'll just talk a little bit about epidemiology and risk factors. Obviously, breast cancer much more common than um, cervical cancer. About one in eight women or 13% of women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Um, we kind of reviewed the estimates in 2022. We know it's the most common new cancer among women in the U.S. and the second most common cause of death. Um, we know that there are um, racial and ethnic disparities in breast cancer as well as socioeconomic disparities in breast cancer, just like there are in cervical cancer. We know that black women are 40% more likely to die of breast cancer and two times more likely to have a triple negative breast cancer. We know that black, Hispanic, and American in Indian or Alaskan women are more likely to have advanced disease. We know that there are treatment delays in Black women as well as those of lower socioeconomic status. I know that the next webinar is going to dive into these um, topics more deeply, but I wanted to give them a brief mention today. Um, so breast cancer risk factors. So who's at risk of breast cancer? We know that as we age, we have an increased risk of breast cancer. We know that female gender, um, we know that patients with a personal history of breast cancer have a higher risk of having a second breast cancer, a previous atypical biopsy. We know patients that have had a history of radiation to the chest between 10 and 30, like for lymphoma are much higher risk of breast cancer, as well as dense breast tissue. Um, we know patients with a genetic mutation, such as BRCA or others, a first degree relative with breast cancer, or a personal family history of other cancers like pancreatic, ovarian, prostate, or melanoma. We know that drinking alcohol, um, having a higher BMI, a high fat, fat diet, a sedentary lifestyle, <clears throat> smoking, and longer hormone exposure. Additionally, non-atypical breast biopsies, other relatives with breast cancer or hormone um, replacement therapy with the combination of estrogen and progesterone can increase those risks. I think this is a nice pictogram, kind of just thinking about uncontrollable and controllable risk factors um, and thinking about how they interact. And then also thinking about things that we can do to prevent breast cancer, like exercise, maintaining a healthy weight <clears throat> and limiting our alcohol intake. So what are the modalities that we use for breast evaluation? <clears throat> Certainly um, self breast exam, we probably all used to have those hangers in our shower reminding us to do our breast exam every month. Sorry. <clears throat> No longer do we talk about self breast exams, so we talk about breast awareness. And I had to look this up. I was like, well, what is breast awareness? How do we describe this? And so it's just that we should be familiar with our breasts and promptly report any changes to our healthcare providers. Um, clinical breast examinations used to be kind of another cornerstone of screening, and I think still are important. Um, some of the societies have kind of gotten away from making strong recommendations, the NCCN, <clears throat> and uh, I think American College of Radiology also are um, the two groups that strongly continue, <coughs> I'm sorry, to encourage um, breast exams, even in asymptomatic women um, when feasible. Other groups suggest that there's not enough uh, evidence to recommend or not recommend or to use um, shared decision making. What everybody agrees on, though, is that if a patient has a breast complaint, they need a breast examination to further evaluate that. Mammograms are um, kind of the cornerstone of breast cancer screening. Um, we have screening mammograms for asymptomatic women and diagnostic mammograms for women with symptoms or women with abnormal screening mammogram results. Um, and so just thinking about our um, classifications, um, patients that are category zero with a mammogram um, need to come back for additional imaging. We don't, we can't answer the question of screening based on the first test. Um, category one and two um, have essentially no risk of malignancy and will return for routine screening. Category three is probably benign, but may be recalled for additional imaging in a short interval, such as a, uh, another mammogram or an ultrasound um, and then either um, be categorized into an up category or a down category um, once that screening um, has um, 
passed. Um, category four and five are going to need tissue diagnosis and need to be referred, um, or typically many places that are doing mammograms are kind of triaging these things themselves and getting these patients in for the biopsies as appropriate. Um, and then category six is when we're doing a mammogram on a known um, malignancy already. So dense breast tissue is noted in about 40% of people undergoing mammograms and abnormalities can hide under this dense breast tissue. It's an independent risk factor for cancer, <clears throat> but not necessarily associated with an increase of death, risk of death from that cancer. Every state is different in their laws and what um, they require insurance cover carriers to cover. In Ohio, we just have to note on the mammogram result that dense breast, breast tissue is present, but there's no requirement for insurance to pay for additional imaging. Um, there's a bill that has gone through the House and it's now in the Senate, um, so it's passed the House, is now in the Senate, that would require coverage for additional imaging or screening if there's an increased risk of breast cancer. And this is defined as family history, uh, personal history, genetic predisposition, as well as dense breast tissue. So we may be having that landscape in Ohio change um, if this passes through the Senate and see maybe some differences in how we um, counsel these patients and what their insurance coverage will um, allow. Ultrasound is not necessarily recommended um, as part of routine screening, but um, some states may advocate for or pay for the cost in dense breasts, and it's frequently used as a diagnostic tool to evaluate either abnormal mammogram findings or abnormal physical exam findings. Um, MRIs are used in screening for high-risk women, and diagnosis for inconclusive mammogram results or ultrasounds, and for treatment planning and evaluating for treatment response. Um, MRIs are recommended in our highest risk group of um, great greater than 20%, um, and then insufficient evidence or against in low or intermediate um, risk patients. And we'll talk about that a little more in the coming slides. So in general, um, breast cancer risk assessment is important because we need to know what our patient's risk of breast cancer is to define what screening recommendation that we would have for them. So we need to define the risk level, um, evaluate screening recommendations, and we want to be able to detect early, reduce risk, and identify patients that should have a genetic evaluation. It's important to remember when we do this risk assessment, when we think about these patients, um, these cancer previvors, um, they're going to have increased doctor visits and screening tests, increased anxiety about developing cancer, financial, financial issues pertaining to screening, screening tests, and kind of that feeling of the inevitable. So important to think about as we're kind of developing this plan, especially for our highest risk patients. And kind of this risk assessment should occur at regular intervals. Somebody that is low risk today could end up being high risk if there is a new cancer diagnosis in their family or something else changes. And so breast cancer risk assessment includes family history, personal history, including demographics, hormonal factors, breast density, history of trust, chest radiation, um, pre previous biopsies that were atypical, um, as well as the use of different risk assessment modules, and then an interpretation of that data to determine their risk and figure out which category do they need to fall in for their screening. Um, and so I found this, I thought it was a really nice infographic kind of like defining how to do this from the Mayo Clinic and kind of a CME that they did. Um, and so the first step is kind of assessing that family his, history um, using a um, inf like a list or a web-based application to determine does that patient qualify for genetic testing? Should they get a genetic test to see, do they have a genetic predisposition for breast cancer? Assessing their personal history demographics, hormones, radiographic risk factors, and then also making sure about previous biopsies or history of trust radiation, and then choosing the best risk prediction model for that patient, the Gale model, the BCSC tool, or the IBIS tool. Um, usually high risk patients can use the last and then the um, family history, I mean, with the IBIS tool, and then the patients that don't have a stronger family history um, could use the BCSC school tool and then interpreting those results to determine next steps. Um, and so this is just a picture. Um, I think that this, um, it's at the BRCA gene screening.org. Um, it's incredibly patient friendly um, when they go. It really is in patient friendly terms. They could fill this out and get their risk assessment in your office if you had a way to do this. Um, it was really straightforward, probably one of the most straightforward ways for patients to tell someone their family history, because I always think it's really hard. Um, even I don't know what people are asking me sometimes. Um, the NCCN guidelines are another way that you can kind of look through these, but these are a lot harder to kind of pick off. 
And so I think that using something that is web-based is a lot easier in practice to kind of decide who needs to go where. Um, so a few red flags I keep in my head because I don't think that you can remember everybody that needs to go to genetics. Um, I always say really young people, people that have multiple primaries, multiple close relatives with the same cancer, triple negative breast cancers, and then the five big ones that are an automatic referral to um, genetics is anybody who's had ovarian cancer or has a family member with ovarian cancer, anybody that has breast cancer or a family member with breast cancer at under 45, metastatic prostate cancer, pancreatic or a male breast cancer are kind of like the big five that are automatic referrals that you can just remember so then you don't have to look them up. Um, testing options, um, most patients will have a multi-gene panel or next generation sequencing to um, multi-gene panel, NGS will be on their tumor, but multi-gene panel to um, evaluate the, the full genetic pan profile. Cascade testing is no used when patients have a known mutation and we're looking for that. Um, important to know, just direct to consumer testing like 23andMe are not a good um, evaluation of um, genetics because the um, they do not test for all the, like even for BRCA, they don't test for all of the genes. And so it's gonna give the patient a, an inaccurate result, either an inaccurate positive or an inaccurate negative result. So if a patient comes with that, that's wonderful that they've done that evaluation, but they really need a multi-gene formal CLIA um, lab test. So um, then moving on to kind of the risk assessments for the patient, um, and then moving on to shared decision-making. I think most patients probably, um, may not go through this whole process, but there are some that will and kind of using the risk assessment and then kind of evaluating their goals. Do they wanna ident identify cancers at the earliest stage? Do they wanna limit unnecessary biopsies, decreased cost, or they just don't wanna know? Um, and kind of creating a, chain, a plan together that can change over time. Um, and so average risk patients, um, you know, the guidelines are all over the place. You know, if we lived um, in another country, we wouldn't even be offering mammograms to patients between 40 and 50. I think that in general, um, having a screening mammogram in your 40s is a good decision and then having a mammogram every one to two years. Um, but certainly using that shared decision making and if a patient is hesitant, understanding why and kind of going through their risk with them can be incredibly helpful. Um, and then um, as people get into their 50s, making sure that they're getting man mammograms every one to two years and then continuing man mammography um, at least into their 70s and potentially beyond for very healthy individuals. Um, so then this is just a little health decision app. I thought this was really helpful for patients that really have a lot of questions for you. It's a place that you can send them to use their, use their time to do this. So you can hit breast cancer screening and you put in your risk factors here. And so I put in my things here. And so if we go to the next page, this tells us if I never got a mammogram in the next 10 years, um, for a thousand women that are like me, nine would survive breast cancer and three would die of breast cancer and 988 would not have breast cancer. Um, if you get a mammogram every um, two years, 14 patients are diagnosed with breast cancer, um, two extra are overdiagnosed and nobody would be saved from a breast cancer death based on this estimate. But an additional 380 patients would be recalled and 63 would undergo a biopsy that is normal. If we go to annual screening, we do have one person that has a cancer death that is prevented um, and 609 recalls and 124 additional biopsies. And so this is for an, a low risk patient. And so kind of if people have questions, they can look at this and start to understand what are we doing with this screening? Obviously this would be very different for a patient who had a much higher risk of breast cancer. So moderate risk patients um, are, you know, kind of a difficult group that 15 to 20%, there aren't really standard guidelines or recommendations, really shared decision-making here is important. Um, <clears throat> starting at age 40 is probably important. Um, testing every one to two years. Um, these are patients that could consider ultrasounds and mammograms for their dense breast tissue or starting even earlier if they have a family history of premenopausal breast cancer. Um, high risk patients. So these are going to be patients that have a greater than 20% risk based on a known genetic mutation, <clears throat> a risk assessment model. Those patients that have had thoracic radiation between the ages of 10 and 30, or the patients that have had an atypical biopsy and an increased risk. <clears throat> 
And so in general, they need to practice breast awareness, have a clinical encounter, including an examination every six to 12 months at age 25, an annual mammogram 10 years older, sorry, younger than the earliest breast cancer diagnosis in their family, but not before 30 at least by 40 though, not after 40. Um, annual breast MRI 10 years earlier, um, but not before the age of 25, a referral to a breast specialist as well as a genetic counseling referral as appropriate. Breast cancer risk reduction. So genetic testing is incredibly important to identify those patients that have a genetic predisposition um, and uh, may have other risk reducing strategies, a healthy lifestyle. Um, avoiding combined estrogen and progesterone therapy for a prolonged period of time. Some of these patients may be offered medications, and so this is why it's important to get these high-risk patients to a breast specialist so they can be evaluated for these things, um, as well as potential surgical or a mastectomy for some of these patients. <clears throat> so survivorship. Um, survivorship is a the buzzword now, I think, in oncology to make sure that we're really taking care of patients after um, cancer and during cancer. Um, so most patients should have a treatment summary, <clears throat> kind of saying their general information, their diagnosis, their stage, and all of their treatment details. What surgery did they have? What chemotherapy did they have? <clears throat> Radiation or any endocrine therapy? Their survivorship care plan is a way to communicate within the healthcare team, as well as for the patient about what is their follow-up plan and schedule. How often do they need to see their oncology team? How often do they need to have imaging done? What are later long-term side effects from treatment that they the patient or their primary care provider should be on the lookout for? Have we evaluated the psychosocial effects of the cancer and the treatment? Do patients and others know what signs and symptoms to look for recurrence? making sure that we get back to the, um, get back on track with ongoing health maintenance, ongoing other cancer screenings, as well as referrals to manage the above and cancer related resources for the patients. So in general, I think that um, moving forward, hopefully there's going to be even more and more survivorship care plans that are shared with um, the patient's entire care team, PCPs, cardiologists, endocrinologists, all of the people that are helping manage the side effects and the toxicities of cancer treatment. Um, but I think that kind of as a primary care provider, thinking about getting back on track, making sure that the patients have had their immunizations. Um, in general, it's safe to get immunizations during treatment, um, but if patients are going to be done with treatment, a lot of times we'll wait till we're finished. Um, COVID-19, the patients may have increased risk, consideration of monoclonal antibodies, preventative like Evyashield, um, other cancer-related screenings, making sure that they're up to date on colonoscopies, mammograms, skin checks, depending on if which of the two cancers that they had, as well as other general health care. Did their diabetes control fall off the rails? Did they stop taking their hypertension medication? Which of these things did they let fall by the wayside while they were going through chemotherapy? As well as encouraging them to maintain a healthy lifestyle with cardiovascular as well as weight bearing exercise, a healthy diet. Um, the Mediterranean diet is most not recommended as well as a uh, screening for genetic referral if that did not happen already. Um, managing treatment toxicities. I think the first thing <clears throat> and something that I forget all the time in my practice is you have to ask. A lot of times people won't tell you it's a problem until you ask, and then you'll have a 20 minute conversation about their menopausal symptoms that they weren't going to bring up. Um, so patients that have treatment for cervical or breast cancer can have lymphedema. Obviously breast cancer patients are going to have upper extremity lymphedema. Cervical cancer patients are going to have lower extremity lymphedema. And so if they have swelling in their extremity referral for physical therapy or to lymphedema clinics is going to be important. Um, screening for depression, anxiety, other mental health concerns, hooking patients in with support groups, um, either in person or virtual, evaluating for different financial toxicities <clears throat> and assistance that we can provide as well as for both breast and cervical cancer, menopausal symptoms. Many patients will be made menopausal either by cervical or breast cancer treatment. <clears throat> so uh, vasomotor symptoms um, are common menopausal symptom in both sets of these patients. In cervical cancer, hormone replacement therapy is safe. <clears throat> for younger patients and really recommended for younger patients. If their uterus is intact, a combination approach is needed with estrogen and progesterone. If patients have had a hysterectomy, estrogen alone would be appropriate. Uh, estrogen patches are typically first line for these patients. Breast cancers, we wanna, patients, we're not going to be using hormonal treatment, um, non-hormonal management um, with um, SSRIs, gabapentin, clonidine, exercise and lifestyle modifications can be um, considered. 
um, treatment related vulvovaginal symptoms, um, history and examination, um, making sure that if patients have significant vulvar symptoms that they have an examination either by the person that's asking the questions or if the person asking the questions isn't doing pelvic exams, referral to a provider that can and evaluate for any sort of lesions, dysplasias, things like that, that could be causing the problems. Um, I usually start by treating with a lubricant um, for intercourse. If dyspnea is a problem, I always recommend non-water-based treatment, coconut oil or silicone-based, a moisturizer that can be used on a regular basis, like KY liquid beads or replens. I give a lot of my patients topical lidocaine mm -hmm. to help with kind of the insertional dyspnea. And I find that the ointments are most effective <clears throat> for both, um, pa you know, patients, regardless of, uh, what treatment has caused their, um, vulvovaginal atrophy, um, as well as vaginal estrogen. Um, I use it very liberally in my cervical cancer patients. Um, I have quite a few breast cancer patients in my practice also who see me because they have a second cancer or I'm watching for ovarian cancer and certainly will use estrogen sparingly in these patients when all of my non hormone non-hormonal treatments have failed. So a small amount of vaginal estrogen may, can be considered. I use pelvic floor physical therapy very liberally in these patients to help with um, uh, pelvic floor problems that can happen with menopause, with treatment for cervical cancer, surgery, radiation, as well as referrals to my urogynecology and urology colleagues for urinary dysfunction that can happen with uh, menopause as well as radiation or surgery for cervical cancer. Um, cervical cancer survivorship. So in typical, in general, we see these patients for pelvic examinations as the oncology team every three to one year, depending on where they are and how close they are to having finished treatment. Um, immediate evaluation is needed for any sort of bleeding, abnormal discharge or new pain for, with intercourse. Um, screening with PAP and HPV is individualized and complex in this um, population. And I didn't have time to do it justice in this talk, but certainly happy to answer questions in the Q&A session about this. Um, they are certainly at risk for vaginal vulvar and anal and perianal malignancies. And so certainly important to do exams and screen for those. These patients have long-term treatment related side effects. And a lot of them are related to the radiation therapy they get. A lot of these patients can have colitis, enteritis, and struggle with bowel obstructions, um, referral to GI for colonoscopy treatment with um, steroid or sucralophate enemas can be helpful. Um, some patients can struggle with chronic um, urinary issues, um, hematuria, urinary dysfunction, as well as vaginal stenosis and vul vulvar dermatitis. Um, some of them may have significant neuropathy from cisplatin. Um, contraception in these patients, there's no restriction. So if you have a patient that's been treated for cervical cancer, still has a uterus, um, has had like a fertility sparing surgery for her cervical cancer and hasn't had radiation, there is, would not be a contraindication to the contraception for her because of the cancer. Um, breast cancer survivorship, obviously want to make sure that evaluation for current breast cancer is happening, and this should be directed by the patient's oncology team. Um, exams and mammograms, screening versus diagnostic should be specified for the by the oncology team what is best for this patient in this situation. Um, symptoms of recurrence should be evaluated both local and distant. Mastectomy, patients that have had a bilateral mastectomy typically won't need a mammogram, but again, should be dictated by the oncology team. Contraception in these patients, we typically avoid hormonal contraception using either barrier or an IUD copper. A lot of these patients will be on aromatase inhibitors and may be struggling with arthritis um, as well as bone loss and need um, a change in the frequency of their DEXA scans. Some that are on tamoxifen could have um, increased risk of VTE. Um, tamoxifen can lead to abnormal uterine bleeding. So certainly any patient um, who has abnormal bleeding on tamoxifen should be referred for evaluation and likely an endometrial biopsy. Those patients that are postmenopausal have the eight most increased risk of precancers or cancers of the uterus, as well as to consider uh, cardiac toxicities from treatment specific to breast cancer, adriamycin and Herceptin or trastuzumab can definitely cause some cardiac toxicity. So evaluating those in your patients. So um, it was a lot. That's what I have. Um, hopefully it's helpful and I'm excited to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Rath. I appreciate it. what a wealth of information. We do actually have some questions yeah. um, in our Q&A box. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have a handful. If you ever you'd like to address those, I know some yeah. linked together or not, but I can um, 
start. Um, so insurance coverage for HPV vaccination, 27 to 45. Um, I've had lots of patients go to CVS. We don't give it in my office because we don't have enough to keep it in stock. Um, haven't had anybody have trouble getting it covered by their insurance at CVS or Walgreens. Um, 3D mammogram, is it recommended for routine screening? So I'm not a breast cancer um, screening expert, um, but what I can say is it doesn't seem to be recommended by, for routine screening in general um, per guidelines now, um, but some places are transitioning to using it. And so my guess is that eventually that will become our standard. Can you speak? about checking for nulliparity when assessing risk for breast cancer. Yes, so patients that haven't been pregnant do have an increased risk of breast cancer and that is evaluated in the risk-based models. So when you fill out those risk-based models for the patients that would increase their risk of breast cancer. If that doesn't answer the question, type back and let me know. Um, was that an automatic referral to genetics if they have a personal history of pancreatic cancer or a first degree relative? Both. They qualify based on NCCN guidelines now for pancreatic. So those, the pancreatic metastatic prostate, breast less than 45, ovarian, forgetting the last one, but those are direct referrals, both personal and first degree relative. Age for screening of daughter, if mother had breast cancer, it depends. Um, it depends on their risk assessment. So this patient, you know, you would need to evaluate, is there a genetic um, syndrome? And does she come, does her mom's breast cancer history, depending on how old the mother was, you know, if it's an 85 year old mother that had breast cancer, that's going to be very different than a 45 year old mother that had breast cancer. And so using those risk assessment tools to put them into the less than 15, 15 to 20, greater than 20% is going to answer that question, but it would depend on the mother's age. Um, how dangerous is hormone supplementation currently felt to be for low risk postmenopausal women who have persistent, significant estrogen deficiency signs and symptoms? I use estrogen very liberally in my patient population of gynecologic cancer survivors. Um, patients that have a personal history of breast cancer are different. And so they, typically are not offered, offered um, hormone replacement therapy. But in general, in young patients that have um, symptoms of menopause. So for example, in my young ovarian cancer survivors or my patients that um, undergo oophorectomy for risk reducing at 35 and don't have a personal history of breast cancer, I do offer them estrogen-based um, HRT, either with an IUD, or um, a hysterectomy so they don't, they don't need progesterone. Um, in general, I think that using it for a short amount of time when a patient starts to go through menopause is safe and effective um, and what I do in my practice. For vaginal dryness products by Bonafide, help with low libido, dyspnea, dryness, all natural medication. Not familiar with that, I'll write it down and look that up. Thank you for the tip. Um, are there any breast cancer risk assessment apps that I use? I don't use an app. I use the web-based um, things. However, I'm giving another webinar in a couple of weeks, and I'm sure as I do my research for that, I will probably find an app that I wish I was using. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, bona, I'm writing it down so I can look this up later. Bonafide. Um, can you address HPV immunization of boys in our practices? How is that going nationally? It is getting better. Um, I think, gosh, I don't have the slides, but I know that the numbers increased a lot, even in Ohio over the last five years, like with our last cancer plan. So not as good as girls getting better. The numbers for boys used to be like 35 or less percent. And I think they're approaching 50% now, but I don't have that number off the top of my head. So getting better. Does your practice use a high risk practitioner? Um, so I guess that's probably like a question, like do we have somebody that manages our high risk patients um, 
for breast, ovarian, or other cancers? And so the answer is um, currently we do not have a high risk in peer and yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, so we actually, Ohio Health has somebody new that's coming on in the next few months that um, will be fulfilling that um, place in our practice, but there, are, I know there are a lot of clinics around. Um, and I think that that's something that's going to be incredibly important. Um, you know, as I was putting this talk together, I was just thinking to myself, you know, um, I struggle counseling my patients about getting mammograms after their cancer diagnoses. And I have a lot more time with my patients than a lot of people would if they were seeing them, you know, for their hypertension and everything else. And I really think that um, we need better resources to be able to quickly screen patients and have these conversations. Why do I think that the rate of breast cancer and cervical cancer is so much higher in Ohio than other states? Um, hard to say. Um, I mean, my guess is that it has to do with sociodemographic factors and the way that we provide healthcare in our state. Yes. <laughs> Marla's chiming in socioeconomic. Yeah. I mean, I think that probably we just don't have as good of a safety net and as good of, um, resources for our, uh, most vulnerable patients. And I think that hopefully this webinar series goes a long way to kind of, um, shining a light on the resources that we have to help these, help these people, but also help our providers help their patients. It's not that people don't want to take care of patients. It's just, it's, it's really hard to do all these things. Thank you, Dr. Rath. I hope everyone enjoyed this session. Uh, I know we covered a lot. Well, thank yeah. you again. And if anyone's interested in learning more, we have more webinars. So please make sure to check the OFP website. And if you're interested in learning more about the Ohio Department of Health BCC program, I just wanted to take a few minutes to introduce John from ODH to discuss BB BCCP. Um, it's another resource and can help, you know, everyone that's out there practicing kind of assist their patients. So Dawn, did you want to share some information? Yeah, so uh, the Breast and Cervical Cancer Project has been in Ohio since the early 90s, and we are one of those safety net programs. Uh, our eligibility has changed over the past years, and we now go up to 300% of the federal poverty level. Uh, we provide both breast and cervical cancer screening and diagnostics. Uh, we also can be a secondary payer for women who have insurance. And we have uh, providers throughout the state that are enrolled as BCCP providers. So we're always looking for providers that would like to refer women to us for the screenings and or diagnostics, and also providers that would like to become BCCP providers. And one of the questions was about with the HPV vaccine. So if you think about it with our most vulnerable populations, the ones who don't qualify for um, Ohio Medicaid, but also don't have the money to afford insurance or have high deductibles. We also pay for HPV vaccination for the women who are receiving any of the screenings, breast or cervical through our program. And we'll pay for all three doses. So that's another added benefit of the program. Excellent. Thank you, Don. I appreciate that. Dr. Rath, thank you again. I really appreciate all of that information. Thanks for joining us today on behalf of the Academy's leadership and staff. We hope that we provided valuable education. Uh, and thank you to all that for all that you do to advance health in your communities. Keep up the passion and dedicated work. We'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone has a few extra questions. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And again, Dr. Rath, thank you for everything. Thank you for inviting me. Sure.